You're listening to a podcast from the South China Morning Post. I can't eat normal tempura again. <laughs> We've been spoiled. Yeah, no. Mmm, <laughs> tempura. Who doesn't like tempura? Many consider it a ubiquitous Japanese dish, consisting of seafood or vegetables coated in a batter and deep fried. Unlike fried food in the West, however, tempura is known for its light batter, which makes the coating very crunchy, but also surprisingly not very oily. This is definitely no Kentucky Fried Chicken style of frying. You can eat tempura anywhere, from street stalls to some of the finest restaurants in the world. But what you might not realize is that we have to thank the Portuguese for this delicious dish. In fact, tempura's origins lie way back in 16th century Portugal in a popular fried bean dish that's actually still eaten today. And the most common of the theories about how tempura made it all the way from the southwest corner of Europe to the far east tells a somewhat tall tale of a trio of Portuguese missionaries. Whose ship was blown off course to Japan? Today on Eat Drink Asia, we'll delve into the history of tempura and investigate how it developed from a Portuguese dish into being one of the most famous and well-loved styles of cooking in Japanese cuisine. The original Portuguese fried bean dish started out as a tasty alternative to meat, eaten during times of religious abstinence or fasting, like Lent. It was known as little fishes of the garden, or fishinhos da horta. It was like a food of the people, so it was used to have very normal ingredients as the flour, the water, and the eggs, the green beans that was fried in tempura, and they have this name because of this similarity with the very used dish in Portugal, that is these fried little fishes. In the 16th century, the Portuguese were adventurous seafarers who travelled regularly to the Far East, trading everything from guns to tobacco. And they took these little fishes of the garden along with them on their voyages. That's not only because they were tasty, but also because frying the vegetables proved to be an excellent way of preserving them for a few more days, when they didn't know how long it would be before they reached the next port. When these traders arrived in Japan in around 1540, they found a culture that was willing to embrace change and try something new. And I think Japan was probably quite、um, was quite intrigued by their their manners and their dress and indeed their food. This newfound culinary knowledge, along with the Japanese desire to please the nobility in Kyoto by providing them with luxurious seafoods, are key to the popularity of tempura in Japan. Learning to preserve sea eel by frying it proved very useful, as it meant it would keep for a few days more on the long journey from Edo to Kyoto, where it could be served to the emperor. I'm Bernice Chan, and I'm Alkira Ryan Frank, and this is Eat Drink Asia, where in each episode we deep dive into an Asian food or drink that's gone global. Stay with us. Tempura is the most difficult Japanese dish to get right because it is so simple. That's why I love making it. This is Isaku Hara, head chef of Tempura Ichitsu in Hong Kong. The original branch in Tokyo has two Michelin stars, and this is the first branch outside of Japan. So, of course, it's one of the very best places in the world to try modern Japanese tempura. Nowadays, Chef Hara says that there isn't just one style of tempura. In Japan, there are two styles of tempura. One is the fine dining style, which we only eat for special occasions. The other is the sort that people eat every day, either for lunch or for dinner. That's the fast food style, and it's very popular. Today, we're going to learn how to cook the fine dining version of tempura. There are just three ingredients in the batter: eggs, flour, and water. And the most important factor in making that batter as light as possible is the temperature of those ingredients. 
flower is a temperature change is so very important. The minus 60. Minus, oh, minus 60. Yes. Oh, so cold flower. Yes. When the flower is kept that cold, it prevents the gluten from activating, which helps to create the very best batter. Next, he coats high quality seafood in the batter. Today, that includes Japanese tiger prawns, scallop, abalone, and uni, or sea urchin. Chef Hara stresses it's incredibly important to use only the freshest ingredients while they are in season. In front of him is a vat of hot oil. Before frying, he checks to see if the liquid is hot enough by sprinkling a few drops of batter into the oil and listens. I'm check, check the ingredients, the bubble. Bubble, bubbles. I'm check the bubbles. Hana? Bubbles under listening, listening. Uh, only bubble under listening. And that's how he carefully cooks each and every piece individually. Only when the bubbles sound just right does he whisk the freshly cooked tempura out of the oil, swiftly dabs away any excess oil, and voila! Simple, but difficult. Scalp, scalp is uh, and uh, build the side no good. The medium layer side got better, temperature better, yes. And we had to give it a try, of course. So the importance of the ingredients really shines through mm -hmm. because the, the seafood that we're eating is just so fresh and so sweet. It's really delicious. I like that it nice is super sweet and it's almost you can taste yeah. the sea, but in a, in a it's not like a fishy way. Very subtle. I can't eat normal tempura again. <laughs> We've been spoiled. Yeah, no. <laughs> What we just ate was some of the best tempura in the world. But to understand how tempura got to this level, we have to go way back to the 16th century to trace its origins to Portugal. And figure out how on earth tempura ended up so popular over 11,000 miles from home. My name is Rodolfo Vicente and I am the head chef of Casa Lisboa in Hong Kong. Chef Rodolfo learned about the history of tempura when he was at school in Portugal. So the Portuguese, when they were um, in the easy expansion on the world, they, they passed through many countries, like India and China and uh, many other countries. And there was these three missionaries in, um, and they were making their way to Macau. But unfortunately, the, the, the boat was mislead and they encountered Japan. At the time there, they start to make uh, some trades with the Japanese people. Guns or uh, soap, uh, tobacco, for example. They had opportunity as well to share many other um, culinary tricks and culinary foods with the, with the Japanese as well. Do a little research online or speak to a Portuguese person and you'll find that what Chef Rodolfo says is the most commonly accepted theory for how tempura got to Japan. But there's one key aspect that doesn't ring true for some. Hi, I'm Annabelle Jackson. I'm a food anthropologist. I'm cur currently studying for my PhD at Goldsmiths College, which is part of the University of London. And my, my key research area is Macanese cuisine, but I found that I needed to go a little bit broader than that, so it's really become Portuguese culinary influence in Asia. We know the Portuguese definitely did travel all over the globe. In fact, they established trade routes all around Asia. So could these three missionaries really have gotten so lost that they ended up in Japan while attempting to sail to the Portuguese port of Macau? I think it's highly unlikely that they were blown off course because we, we, we know from history that the Portuguese were really expert seafarers. They had already come down through, around South Africa, through the Indian islands and arrived in Goa. I mean, this doesn't look like getting blown off course to me. Having Macau as a base in the, in the middle of all of those makes real sense. Whether they got lost on their way or not, what is certain is that they did arrive in Japan. The evidence is clear in artworks depicting those events. And we have a series of screens which depicts the arrivals of the ships. And, and clearly there was a lot of fascination 
with these foreign people who were certainly white Portuguese, but also there would have been different Asian nationalities on the ships and probably African slaves as well. And what the Portuguese chose to do on arrival in Japan was to integrate rather than colonize. I think the Portuguese colonial project was quite different to other countries, in particular the British and the Dutch, because the Portuguese decided that if they mixed and married locally, the chances were that though that greater integration would lead to better trade opportunities. Chef Hara agrees that the Japanese were indeed intrigued by the arrival of the Portuguese and wanted to learn from them. The Portuguese brought guns and flour with them to trade. The Japanese already knew how to use guns, but not flour. When they asked them what to do with the flour, the Portuguese told them to use it to fry vegetables. They still weren't sure how to do it, so the Portuguese taught them how to make a batter and how to fry it. That's how tempura started in Japan. Before we get on to how tempura became so incredibly popular all over Japan, let's find out more about the origins of the name. And how Peixinhos de Ota became tempura. The key question, of course, is whether the word tempura is Portuguese or Japanese in origin. This is food anthropologist Annabelle Jackson again. She says there are three possible roots. I think our friend here is etymology because, very simply, if you look at the word to cook in Portuguese, it's tempera. And cookery in Portuguese is temporo. And then we have a third word, um, temporis, which is very much associated with the fish on Fridays idea, the, or even a, a vegetarian concept. So this, this suggests to me very strongly that tempura is coming from this Portuguese term or these Portuguese terms. Chef Rodolfo from Casa Lisboa agrees this makes sense. He explained that the fried bean dish was commonly eaten on days when Catholics avoided eating meat. It uh, used to be eaten at the 40 days at Lent. So they used feasting from the meat and these vegetables was a, a, new, a new and good thing that they, they could have it. It's also commonly believed that the word was easy for the Japanese to say. And so tempura became the name we all know for their newfound delicacy. Once the dish arrived in Japan, it quickly became well known right across the country, which may seem surprising. So why were the Japanese of the time so keen to embrace the dish and make it theirs? Chef Hara says it started with the welcoming environment those traders and missionaries found when they arrived. The 1500s in Japan was a period of civil war, and Oda Nobunaga was one of three leaders who helped unify the country. This was a time when people were open-minded towards new ideas. They wanted to learn more about the world, especially things they could learn from visitors from the West. One of those new ideas was how to make tempura. And like a modern viral sensation, both Chef Hara and Chef Rodolfo say that tempura spread like wildfire from one town to the next thanks to street food stalls. They start to spread the, the tempura through the country. So each little village start to have it his own little stores and uh, start to create their own recipe of tempura. And when they start to unify the country and start to share all of these recipes between themselves, they, they really understood that it was already spread to the country and uh, they had it as a, as a national dish. Many people were introduced to tempura because of yatai, or small roadside food stores, which families ran to earn money in those times. At this stage, tempura was still very much just a cheap food for the people. But it didn't stay that way for long. The Portuguese had discovered that not only did frying food in batter make it taste great, it also made it keep for longer. This revelation was something the Portuguese found particularly useful during their long voyages at sea. In these long journeys, they weren't able to, to preserve uh, the, the food for each port they stop. And even if it, they couldn't preserve it for a long, long time, just the way to, to cook it, they were able to, to preserve it for a few more days. 
and uh, on the ship when you never know what's going to be the next stop that might be a, a, a good fixture. Passing on that knowledge to the Japanese was absolutely key to taking tempura from the masses to the nobility. After they learned how to make tempura vegetables, the Japanese decided to try the same method with sea eel. Learning to preserve sea eel by frying it proved very useful, as it meant it would keep for a few days more on the long journey from Edo to Kyoto, where it could be served to the emperor. So that's how an everyday fried bean dish from Portugal became a dish fit for an emperor in Japan. Having learnt so much about how tempura developed, it only seems fair to go full circle now and compare the two, the Japanese version and the Portuguese version. At Casa Lisboa, Chef Rodolfo showed us how to make his own version of Peixinho de Horta with enoki mushrooms instead of green beans. Similar to Chef Hara, he says you can actually make the dish with a wide variety of ingredients and that he uses only the freshest seasonal vegetables. The batter he prepares is thicker than Chef Hara's, but it's still made with the same three ingredients, flour, eggs and water. The difference here is that the water Chef Rodolfo uses is very, very cold. It's then beaten until the consistency is just right. And you have the right consistency. This is the important part, where you have the right consistency, so you can get stick to the vegetables, and at the same time it, uh, it fries and it gets this crispy layer, and doesn't come out to, to the vegetables, of the vegetables. The vegetables are then dipped into the batter and lightly seasoned. A little bit of pepper, fine salt. And finally they go into the fryer. Again, they go in one at a time, so none of the pieces stick together. The process of frying in really hot oil seals the moisture into the vegetables, so they're crunchy on the outside and lovely and moist on the inside. They really were delicious. And I have to say that having now seen both dishes prepared right in front of me, I can see how they are very clearly related to one another. We couldn't let Chef Rodolfo go without asking him one very important question. How does he feel that most people have no idea that the origins of tempura are Portuguese? Of course, we'd like the people to know that the tempura starts uh, in us and uh, we, we, we give to them the, the tempura, but uh, we are completely satisfied that uh, they, they, they really did a nice job with that. We, we are not on the things, so we share and uh, after the, they, they improve it or they use it in their own way, and uh, that is really pleasant and it's really good to, to see that the things can, uh, can evolve and can, uh, can have their own way in the world. Indeed, many of the foods we know and love today have effectively developed as a fusion of ideas from different cultures and backgrounds before developing their own distinct identities. It's a sentiment that Annabelle Jackson, the food anthropologist, agrees with. I guess when a dish or a cuisine becomes so much part of the culture, you, you really could start to claim it as your own. And I'm not sure that there is such a thing as a pure cuisine. And just as, as people have moved um, around the globe, obviously since the 1500s or before, as people move, so food moves and food habits change. All right, Bernice, tough question for you. You've had a chance to try a version of the original Portuguese fried dish and also a high-end Japanese tempura. How do they stack up? Well, I have to say that the Japanese version was really, really refined. It was like next level tempura because Chef Hara, he just lightly dipped the prawns or the abalone into the batter and then fried it. So you, you had the slightly crunchy texture on the outside, but you really tasted the sweetness, the fresh sweetness of the seafood. So it was really amazing. But how did it compare to the Portuguese version? The Portuguese version was um, 
the batter was thicker. So it's more like um, regular tempura that we would eat in an average Japanese restaurant. So it was uh, more oily than uh, the Japanese tempura? I'd say it's pretty much on par to what you would probably eat in a regular Japanese restaurant, like that that kind of tempura. It was a little bit oily, but I wouldn't say it was terribly oily. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. What about for you, how did you find this whole episode? Because I like... I feel like in this series, we do find out some interesting bits of information, but I'm saying everything about this episode was completely new to me. I had no idea Tempura came from Portugal. No idea whatsoever. So, yeah, totally eye-opening experience this time. This episode is produced and edited by Carolyn Wright. And we want to thank Chef Isaku Hara, Chef Rodolfo Vicente, Annabelle Jackson... Nadim Shad and Queenie Ho for translating. If you want to ask about a dish or a drink, tweet us at BurnUnitHK or at Alkira Ryan Frank. Eat Drink Asia is a monthly podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or basically anywhere you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, happy eating! For more podcasts from the South China Morning Post, head to scmp.com where you can hear more about technology, trade, culture, and society.